Welcome back. Welcome back. Try that again. I'm not hearing the mic. I'm sure my sound team back there has it under control. Um, tonight we're going to not be in the book of Philippians. Pastor offered me a chance to use his, own, his notes or to freelance, and uh, I thought I'd freelance it. Hey Amen. We can see how that goes, but I uh, want to talk about some truths about prayer, praise, and worship. I am a big guy into kingdom principles. Isaiah 55, 8 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. Often, the way God does things is, I'm going to use a big word here, diametrically opposed, or 180 degrees from the way we would do them. Matthew 16, 25, For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Doesn't make sense in the natural. You want to be, who wants to be the greatest? Great, then be servant to all. Um, or don't have enough money? Give your way out of being poor. Be faithful in what you have, and God will bless it. These are not things that in the natural make sense. Even Jesus' death and resurrection, Israel was looking for a Messiah. They were looking for a political king to come and crack some heads, throw the Romans out, and uh, make them a great nation. They were not expecting their Messiah to come as a lamb, a sacrificial lamb who had to die on a cross to see our sins forgiven. They were not expecting that. God's ways are often not our ways. But if, as we read our Bible, we can glean kingdom principles, things that are true throughout the Scripture in the Old Testament, and the New Testament. And we need to take a hold of these things. And I want to talk about some of them regarding, again, prayer, praise, and worship. We're going to, this will be a little long section of scripture. I hope you're ready to travel around the Bible tonight. Because there are 66 books and I'm not visiting all of them, but I'm doing my best to get there in one setting. Second Samuel you could turn to chapter 24. You've got your Bible tonight. Amazingly enough, 2 Samuel comes after 1 Samuel, if that's a help to anybody. After 1 Samuel, yes, sir. And I know enough not to say before 3 Samuel, because there's not a 3 Samuel. And if I need to cover for uh, not knowing where something's at, I can just say it's in the book of Hezekiah. Second Samuel chapter 24, verses 18 through 24. And Gad came that day to David and said to him, Go up and erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aruah the Jebusite. So David, according to the word of the Lord, went up as the Lord commanded. Now Aruah looked and saw the king and his servants coming towards him. So Aruah went out and bowed before the king with his face to the ground. Then Aruah said, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? And David said, to buy the threshing floor from you, to build an altar to the Lord, that the plague may be withdrawn from the people. Now Arah said to David, let my Lord King take and offer up whatever seems good to him. Look here, oxen for burnt sacrifice and threshing implements and the yokes of oxen for wood. All these, O King, Arah had given to the king. And Arah said to the king, may the Lord your God accept you. Then the king said to Arara, No, I, but I will surely buy it from you for a price. Nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God, with that which costs me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. Anything of value has a cost to it. 
It must cost something. We can see it in the Garden of Eden. God shed the blood of animals to make coverings for Adam and Eve. So when they sinned, it wasn't just, you know, it's forgiven and went on. There, there was a cost to it. Animals had to die. Blood had to be shed for that sin to be covered. Later on, we find Abel making an acceptable sacrifice to the Lord. With Cain and Abel, Cain made a sacrifice of fruit and vegetables. Abel did an animal sacrifice. Again, according to the same pattern as when animals were shed to get their skins, so Abel made the acceptable sacrifice. In context here, the price here are offerings made to cover sin. Jeremiah 33, verses 10 and 11 Jeremiah 33, sorry about that, verses 10 and 11. Thus says the Lord, again, there shall be heard in this place of which you say, it is desolate without man and without beast in the cities of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem that are desolate, without man and without inhabitant and without beast, the voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, and the voice of the bride, the voice of those who say, Praise the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good, for his mercy endures forever. And of those who will bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. For I will cause the captives of the land to return, as at the first says the Lord. And I want to key on that, that portion there, those who bring the sacrifice of praise. So we were talking about there being a cost. Here praise is going on, sacrificial praise that has a cost to it. Who's ever felt too tired to go to church? Amen. Too defeated or depressed or just been too busy in your day to stop and spend any time praising and worshiping God. You know, I've got a lot of things to do today. I have a full schedule. I can't find any time in it to stop and read my Bible. I can't find any time in it to praise the Lord. We don't praise because of our circumstances sometimes or how we feel. And you know what? Sometimes we just don't feel like it. But it's a sacrifice of praise. We can praise God because of who he is. Because he is, you know, praise the Lord of hosts. Not because of who we are. Not because of what's in our bank account. Um, money can go away. Um, the house can be washed away. Your health can evaporate. You know, it says that we are but a vapor. And I feel that sometimes. As I'm getting older, I realize that uh, I have a limited amount of time on this. I'm, I'm like a loaf of bread. I'm going, I'm going to stale date at some point. Whether I know it or not, or when it's going to happen, I'm not going to be here forever. I'm just here temporarily. And no matter how I'm feeling, no matter what's going on, God deserves praise. And that's talking about sacrificial prayer. Amen. I'm going to say something here. Hopefully it's not too controversial. You can bring up Matthew 5, verse 47. Five forty-seven. And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? 
Do not even the tax collectors do so? This is, a, this is one of those kingdom principles. This is something Jesus asked each of us. What do you do more than others? What do you do more than the average person, than the sinner does? You know what, the sinner, they'll get excited when they're feeling good, when things are going well, when there's money in the bank. They're excited when they're able to go out and party. They're excited when everything's going great. It's easy to do. Being excited and praising God when things are going wrong, that's a whole other story altogether. But that's, you know, again, the sacrifice of praise. That is a kingdom principle that we praise God because of who he is, not because of who we are, not because of our situation and circumstances. You know what? I would love to celebrate you when things are going well. If you win the lottery, I'd love to come over and celebrate with you your winnings. But if things aren't going well, we still need to praise God. And as a church, we need to be there for those who are going through it. Too many times people are treated like a leper when things are going wrong. Not in my notes, but you know what? When sometimes when things are going rough, it's hard, you know, to lift your head up. And you can get together with someone and you can pray with them and you can praise God together even when it's going rough. You know, because that praise is, an, is a sacrifice. It's an offering to God because, because of who he is, not because of who you are, not because of what you have, but it's because of who God is. There is a verse in the Bible that says, and I'm trying to remember where it's at. I think it's in Isaiah. But it makes a statement that God humbles himself to look down upon all creation. God is so great, he has to humble himself to look at all the universes. He has to humble himself to look at all the galaxies. He has to humble himself to look down on our planet. He then further humbles himself and looks down at you and looks at you and says, I love you. He is willing to humble himself to that degree because he loves us so much. He is truly worthy to be praised. Not just because he created everything, but again, he loved us first. And despite every situation, despite every lie of the devil, despite everything that he does to try to steal your joy, try to rob you of it, if you can be robbed because situation is what makes you happy, is where things are at, the devil will do it. We need to not be like an, you know, an airplane. The altitude is determined by the attitude of the plane. As Christians, we need to be thermostats, not thermometers. A thermometer will just read the temperature. If it's cold, it's low. If it's hot, it's high. A thermostat sets the temperature and stays at it. What did Joshua say? Yes, as for me and my house, choose this day whom you will serve, but I am going to serve the Lord. That's a thermostat. That's making a declaration. I don't care about circumstance. I don't care about all the things going on. I don't care about the lies of the devil. I don't care about health, wealth, or anything. I am going to serve God. I am going to be faithful to God. So as I said, point one, anything of value has a cost to it. And sacrificial praise is precious to God, and it's something we need to embrace because again, Things aren't always great all the time. Second thing I want to talk about is there is power. Actually, before I, I do that, any questions? And I'm going to bring the mic to you if you have one. So, yeah, I, I know that will probably taper off on the questions, but I want people to be able to hear what's going on. I promise we're only going to record the back of your head. There's not a camera behind me. All right, number two, there is power in the lifting up of hands. This is another kingdom principle. This is another thing they're not going to talk about down at the Red Cross. They're not going to teach it to you at your job. Exodus chapter 17, if you'd like to turn there. I'm 
I am lucky that going through the Bible like this is not like running a race because I've ran you over to one area in the New Testament to immediately turn you around and run you back to the other end of the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 17, verses 10 and 12. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And so it was, when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy. So they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Back to my ways, you know, are not your ways. There, for some reason, there is power in the hand. The hand is the ability to do, to accomplish. Uh, there, was a, uh, there was a point in time where the children of Israel lost the Ark of the Covenant. And, uh, gosh, I believe it was the Philistines that had it. They rolled it into one of their cities and parked it in front of one of their gods. The next morning they came out and their god was fallen over. They picked it back up. The next morning they came out, it had fallen over, and the head was broke off and the hands were broken off. And the head denotes authority and the hands denote the ability to do anything. Hands are important. And the lifting of hands is important. When our hands are lifted, let's talk about that. When the police tell you to put your hands up, You put them up and surrender. When hands are lifted, we're also in a position of surrender to God. When we're like that, we are, our hands are apart, we're surrendered to the Lord, and we're worshiping Him, and it's not about us, it's about Him. We are yielding to God. It is acceptable to God as the making of a sacrifice is, that we surrender. You know, heaven is full of angels. And the angels do whatever God says to do. When we surrender to God, we're doing something no angel can do. We have decided on our own to do so. And that is precious to God. There is something about that, that surrender, where, I, where we go, you know what? It's not what I think is best. It's not how I want to do it. But God, I surrender to you. I yield to you. Because I want to. When we raise our hands, something spiritually powerful happens. Why is this? Because God says it does. The Bible shows us that, again, with Moses here, when his hands were raised up, the children of Israel were having victory. And when the hands were down, the children of Israel were being defeated. That's a good analogy, like an antenna. Because we're tuned into another source. It, defi it def defies our, again, a way of thinking. God's ways are not our ways. As we praise God in surrender with our hands up, God comes on the scene. Because when Moses' hand was up, again, the children of Israel were prevailing. God is on the scene when we surrender and we raise our hands. In prayer, this is true as well. When we lift our hands in prayer, God comes on the scene. Spiritual power is released as we lift our hands and intercede before God. Even if you don't feel it, know it in faith. And I mean that. In my own prayer life, I, there are times where I'm praying and it's like, I need to lift my hands up. I know I need to lift my hands up because there's something that happens in the supernatural where I don't see it when my hands are lifted up. I know because the Bible tells me it happens. The Bible shows it happening. And I'm going to say at this point, you can think I'm a crackpot. You cannot agree with it, but give it a try. Give it a try. It's a spiritual principle. Uh, I don't have to defend God on that. If it's God's principle, it'll work. Because that's the way God says it is. 
And if it's my idea, well, your mileage is not vary on it then, but yes, you may. I'm going to repeat that. Sister here was in rehab, and uh, they were telling people there, you know, they needed to raise their hands and worship God, and that if you weren't able to raise your hands, that what it was say, saying is you were still bound. At which point she started raising her hands. Amen. Make sure I know where I'm at in my notes. I normally don't get lost. <laughs> On to our third point. Our prayers are like an incense before God. Since we've already brought up the topic of prayer. Psalms 141 verse 2. Let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. And then I'm going to hit Revelation 5.8. You don't have to turn there. Now, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And again, we're going to go on that, the prayer of the saints. The Bible doesn't ask us to walk around our house with little bowls of incense so there's a pleasant smell to the Lord from the incense that's burned. The prayers of the saints are incense to the Lord. So let's talk a little bit about the incense and the natural. It's beaten fine to a powder. And I'm going to say, you know, again, different ingredients in it. Our prayer should be like that. A prayer is not like a log on the fire. We just take the one thing and just kind of slap it on. It's not a vain repetition where you pray the same thing over and over again. But it's a blend of ingredients. Our prayer will have praise in it. Our prayer will have surrender in it. Our prayer will have petitioning where we're asking God for things. Our prayer will have where we're talking to God about what's going on in our life what we're happy about, what we're afraid about, what we'd like to see happen, what we don't understand. Because I know there's plenty I don't understand about the Bible, and I'm always asking, Lord, what does that mean? I'm just trying to paraphrase that, that. Talk about the condition of the heart when you're praying. I mean, you can pray something. Lord, please help me. Lord, please help me. And that's not a vain repetition. But you also haven't gone on autopilot and checked out. If it's a memorized prayer, just like doing the timetables. You know, if you want me to do all the twos, I can sit here without thinking 
and go two times two is four. Two times three is six. Two times four is eight. And as I'm going through those, I can think about dinner. I can think if I have ironing that needs to be done. I am just checked out. I am not really in that anymore. That's vain repetition. And that's a rope prayer that you're just running through the motions on. And, you know, there, there are written prayers in the Bible. You can look, you know, where, you know, the disciples say to Jesus, how are we to pray? And he goes through a prayer. That doesn't have to, that does not have to be vain repetition. Matter of fact, that's a, mo that's a model prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Amazingly enough, we're supposed to petition God to help us out. Forgive me of my death, my sins, as I have forgiven others. Man, you need to be praying for forgiveness. And that's not like I'm pointing somebody out in particular that you're horrible. But we all sin, we all fall short of the glory of God. And I can tell you my own personal prayer life, the first thing I usually do when I enter into prayer starts off like this. Dear Father God, I come before you. I come before your throne of grace. And I would ask you to forgive me of my sins, of anything I've done, and if I have things I know I've done, like yelled at my wife, felt tempted to cheat on my taxes, whatever it is, I'm going to confess those things. Anything I don't know, Lord, forgive me of them. Cover me with the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. And now I boldly enter into your throne room of grace. Forgiveness is the first one up for me, man. I do not want to be the priest who walks into the throne room without the garments on without concern for what's going on. I, I want to take care of sin in my life first. I want to be able to boldly stand before God. I want to be able to pray with conviction. I want to be able to pray like someone who expects God to do something. Once again, not because of who I am. It's because Jesus died for me and saved me. And he's cleansed me of my sin. I am not capable of my own entering in, but because of him, I can enter in. Yep, Exodus 30, 34, and 36, which we'll, we'll read here. Exodus 30, 34 through 36, where I was talking before about incense. Now, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures, wait, you didn't move, change verses on me. So much for trying to look up at the camera while reading verses. And the Lord said to Moses, take sweet spices, stack tea and onica and galbium and pure frankincense with these sweet spice. There shall be equal amounts of each. You shall make of these an incense, a compound according to the art of the perfumer, salted, pure, and holy. And you shall beat some of it very fine and put some of it before the testimony in the tabernacle of the meeting where I will meet with you. And it shall be most holy to you. Where I shall meet with you. When we pray, the Lord meets with us. Philippians, again, we we're in Philippians. I'm going to read from chapter 4, verse 6, which at the rate pastor is going about five or six months from now, we'll get there. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Talking about incense again, it is heated up. Without heat, incense is of little value. It does not give off an aroma. This is true, same thing as true of prayer without fervency. Again, that vain repetition prayer is dead, lifeless. But when we pray and we believe, and you know what, I know my God's a living God. I know he answers prayer. I'm excited about being able to pray. Matthew 15, verses 7 and 8.
hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. It's that heart condition. That fervency is from the heart. And it smells sweet. Prayer should be a, a pleasing to God, something he wants to savor. Proverbs 15, 8. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. So in closing, again, anything of value has a cost to it. There is power in lifting up of hands. There is power in, again, making sacrificial praise. And our prayers are like an incense before God. If we are willing to pay a price and go above and beyond what is expected of us by the world, even by other Christians, you know what? It doesn't matter if you think I'm the holiest guy in the world. It doesn't matter if you think I've got it all together. If I know that I'm only giving God 95%, not 100, it doesn't matter you think I'm doing fine. God knows I'm chiseling him on 5%. What more do I do than others? And I phrase that about myself because that's what I try to measure myself. What more do I do? Not what more does someone else do, not how does someone else look. It, again, it doesn't matter if some, everyone would think I'm the successor to Billy Graham. does not matter. If I know I'm just kind of cruising there and I'm not do even 100%, it's not worth anything. It's not worth anything to God. What more do you do than others? If we will lift our hands up and praise God, again, even when we don't feel like it, and pray to him, it will be acceptable and things will happen. Prayer moves a hand that moves the world. And I believe these are spiritual principles. And we could, I could have titled this instead, How Come Nothing Happens When I Pray? Do you lift your hands? Have you ever sacrificially prayed? Or do you only pray when it's convenient and easy? Did it cost you anything? And just take that to heart, really. That what do you more than others? If you will pursue God, love him with your whole heart, and seek him, he'll meet you, he'll answer your prayers, not even because of who you are, but because of who he is. He wants to. What father would give his son a stone if he asked for bread? And on that note, we're going to close in a quick prayer tonight. Dear Father God, we come before you. Lord, I would pray that your word would just take root in our heart. I would pray right now, Lord, that we would be able to just keep a hold of these kingdom principles and you would bring them to mind, Lord God. That the next time where I'm down, that we, I'd go, you know what, Lord? It's not about me, it's about you. And I'm going to lift my hands and praise you because of who you are. Not because of who I am, not because of the situation, but because I know I am loved by the great creator of all. And I would ask this this night in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all for being with us tonight. Uh, we will see you this Sunday.